All right, good evening again, everyone. As you all enjoy your entrees, I want to continue with our program tonight. As many of you know, I'm sure, uh, the Tona Prizes were launched in, 20, in 2009, and they have grown to be one of the most prestigious awards in American political journalism. And that is thanks to the support from a number of organizations, including Robin's home paper, The New York Times. And in addition, The Washington Post, Bloomberg, Politico, J.P. Morgan Chase, and now my journalistic home, CNN, also have been generously supportive of this program, so we thank them for that. The Toner Prizes are not the only thing that has grown in the last 14 years. Uh, so have Robin's children, Nora and Jake. They are so grown now that they're not here tonight. They're busy. <laughs> but taking their place is someone who deserves quite a lot of credit for what this program has become, and that is their father, Peter Gosselin. So once again, uh, the Toner Prizes was started more than a decade ago to keep alive the idea of fact-based political journalism in the face of an extraordinary amount of upheaval. And that upheaval hasn't ended since then. Okay. Yeah. That upheaval has not ended since then. Uh, we've recently been talking a lot not only about cost pressures, but AI, anyone? <laughs> so having taken part in the telecommunications revolution, Syracuse alumnus and former board of trustees, Chair John Chappell of Hawkeye's Investments, has had a better understanding of what was happening more than most people. Now, John was a friend of Robbins at Syracuse, and at, after her death, he helped underwrite the launch of this program. And he's been a supporter ever since. So we want to thank John tonight, even though he could not be with us today. Now this program has only, uh, th the problems that face our industry have only grown more complex in recent years. And tonight you're going to hear from some individuals from Syracuse University and from the Newhouse School about those challenges and how uh, the Newhouse School in Syracuse are trying to address them by establishing a brand new Washington-based institute. So I will let them get into those exciting details, but I do want to recognize some people whose uh, generosity uh, are incredibly important, uh, including Syracuse trustee and founder of CBS Market Watch and the former president and publisher of USA Today, uh, Newhouse alumnus, Larry Kramer. Larry, say hi to everyone. <laughs> I also want to introduce Mark Lodato. Mark was a Toner Prize juror before he became dean. And during his 30-year career, he was also a television reporter and an anchor in major markets all across the country and a faculty member as well at Arizona State University's Cronkite School, where we met a couple of years ago. He was the Associate General Manager with Arizona PBS, and since July of 2020, he's been the Dean of the Newhouse School. So Dean Lodato is going to explain and describe the Newhouse School's uh, plans together with Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs to establish this new university institute here in Washington, D.C. Then he's going to go ahead and pass the baton to the newly named Kramer Director, my friend Margaret Taleb, who, um, who will be following. Syracuse University Ch uh, Chancellor and President, uh, Ken Saverud. So without further ado, Dean Lodato. Good evening, and thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight to this beautiful venue to celebrate the Newhouse School's Toner Prizes for Excellence in Political Reporting. And thank you, Abby, for the kind introduction 
As CNN's senior political correspondent and anchor of Inside Politics Sunday, you are the perfect journalist to serve as our host tonight. Your work illuminates the political stories that matter and just as importantly, strives to explain how these topics impact the public, so thank you. I would also like to take a moment on, to welcome again Chancellor Kent Siverud, Provost Gretchen Ritter, Dean David Van Slyke of the Maxwell School, Dr. Ruth Chen, Professor of Practice in the College of Engineering and Computer Science, and again, University Trustee Larry Kramer. This is actually my third Toner Prizes ceremony as Dean of the Newhouse School, but my first one where we are able to celebrate in person. And what a wonderful time we are having so far, not just for me, but for also the Syracuse University students from the Newhouse and Maxwell schools who are joining us here tonight. It's always wonderful to have students with us. <laughs> These students strive to live up to the standards of the great reporters who came before them, like Robin Toner, a 1976 graduate of Syracuse University, where she earned dual degrees from the Newhouse and Maxwell schools. The prizes are now among the most prestigious awards in political journalism. Entries are judged on how well they reflect the high standards and depth of reporting that marked Robin's career. Before moving to higher education, as Abby mentioned, I spent more than 15 years in broadcast journalism, and like some of you, I covered City Hall, the State Capitol, Congress, and on some occasions, the White House. Having also previously served as a judge for the Toner Prizes, I know full well that the breadth and depth of the quality of work produced by our award winners and other reporters gathered here tonight. Journalism is more than a profession. It is a public service. And at its best, political reporting illuminates the electoral process, reveals the politics of policy, and engages the public in democracy. This kind of high-quality, fact-based journalism championed by Robin, Robin Toner is more important than ever. Our students are entering the profession at a pivotal time. Polls show that trust in journalism and media is low, newsrooms face increasing financial pressure, and technology continues to change the way we report. But I can say with pride tonight, however, that our students remain undeterred. Their enthusiasm for the profession is infectious, and the Newhouse School will provide the education, training, and hands-on experiences to help them become the next great generation of journalists. They will have faculty members, like esteemed former journalist Beverly Kirk, to guide them in the nation's capital. Beverly is Newhouse's new director of our Washington programs, and she has also served as a toner judge this year. And one of our latest efforts, as you heard at Syracuse, offers another example of the university's commitment to better equipping students for success and fostering a more engaged and informed citizenry. Newhouse and the highly ranked Maxwell School are collaborating to build the Syracuse University Institute for Democracy, Journalism, and Citizenship. This joint initiative aims to help repair what is broken while giving students a valuable experience in the process. As a school that trains aspiring journalists and writers and reporters, Newhouse is compelled to tackle the challenges facing communications and journalism. And we hope those here tonight in the audience will join us. I too want to special, say a special thanks to Larry Kramer, who also has helped us create this new role we have here tonight, and that's introducing our next uh, speaker, Margaret Tolev. She is the founding Kramer Director of the Institute for Democracy, Journalism, and Citizenship. Margaret joined Syracuse just a little bit earlier this year following a 30-year career covering American politics and the White House. Many of you know Margaret, but allow me to briefly boast about a few of her credentials. Prior to joining Newhouse, Margaret was the managing editor for, poli for politics at Axios. She was senior White House correspondent for Bloomberg News and McClatchy Newspapers, where she won the Scripps Howard Raymond Clapper Memorial Award as part of a team that exposed the politicization of the Justice Department. Margaret has covered the administrations of Presidents Trump, 
and Obama, as well as Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. In addition to her role at Newhouse, Talev is also senior contributor at Axios and a CNN political analyst. So please join me in welcoming Margaret Talev. Awesome. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you. It's so wonderful to see reflections of parts of your faces through the lights here tonight. Um, thank you, Dean DeLaudato. Thank you, Dean Van Slyke. And a warm welcome to all of you, to Senator Romney, to Abby Phillip, to tonight's winners, to Syracuse University leaders, esteemed journalists, and guests. Um, to Peter Goslin, the dogged economics and investigative reporter and public servant who made me promise not to introduce him. I lied, I'm doing it anyway. And loving father, you have kept Raghavan's legacy burning bright. I think a shout out to Bruce Springsteen also is in order. The boss picked tonight for his DC show on the current tour. Um, Robin Toner references to Bruce Springsteen actually go back in her campaign trail copy at least to the early 90s, 1991, early 92 campaign coverage. She describes Senator Bob Kerry taking the stage in Nebraska to Born to Run, which just goes to show that some political traditions will outlast all of us. So thank you uh, to the Bruce fans who decided to be here with us tonight. Um, I'd also like to recognize Larry Kramer. Thank you, Larry, and Kathy Jacoff. Uh, their support really has been crucial to the endeavor that I want to brag on a little bit before we, uh, before we award our awards. And of course, um, that is Syracuse University's new Institute for Democracy, Journalism, and Citizenship. For 30 years, as uh, Mark kindly um, described, I have covered American politics, and I do believe deeply in the power of political reporting to inform people about how policies, how laws, and how elections impact their lives. But I also know that many of today's readers and viewers and listeners just feel overlooked or exhausted by the politicians who are supposed to represent them and the media that is supposed to represent them and cover them, and they just want to tune it all out and disappear into TikTok before it gets banned. And they're unsure. A lot of people are unsure what purported facts or sources they can trust or they should trust. People today say they want to minimize conflict. They want to minimize judgment from other people. And so we see in the data that people increasingly avoid even friendships, much less dating or relationships, with people who come from different political persuasions. Um, people avoid exchanging views that might be controversial outside of circles that they already are confident they know how everyone feels. And they avoid seeking middle ground with people with whom they may disagree. And these are new upticks in these trends. And they can actually fuel unintended consequences, such as tribalism, such as conspiracy theories, such as violence. For me, after January 6th, I knew that I wanted to turn more of my energy to addressing these challenges. But I wasn't sure how. And I know that's something a lot of the other reporters in this room and many non-reporters in this room can probably relate to. And then I heard about what Syracuse wanted to build. And I thought, that's what I want to be part of. So as you've heard a little bit about tonight, the Institute is a joint endeavor of Newhouse and Maxwell of the School of Public Communications and the School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. And this dual approach is unusual in democracy institutes. And it's also so important because democracy and journalism rise and fall together. There can be no healthy democracy without a strong, independent, free press, and vice versa. The challenges are intertwined, and so are the solutions. So in the coming months, we'll launch research, teaching, 
dialogue, and public events, all aimed at approving both the public, the student, and the industry, our industry, other industries, understanding of these challenges and creating new paths for constructive civil discourse. We're also going to be gearing up to open the Institute's future physical headquarters inside Syracuse's new Washington headquarters at DuPont Circle. More to come on this soon. All of you will be welcome, and I look forward to hosting all of you there for an event as soon as possible. Uh, at this institute, both in DC and around the country, we are going to be looking through research, through education, and through programming to the next generation and to emerging technology, even the scary stuff, to lead us to higher ground. We'll address polarization, misinformation, news deserts, and global threats to democracy and to the free press. And we'll look beyond just Washington, and we'll look beyond just pure politics to how democracy and freedom are facing tests in science, in the military, in the workplace, in sports, in entertainment. If this sounds like something that excites you, something that you would like to become involved with, we want all of you. We want your support, <laughs> of course. Uh, we want your ideas, and we want your participation. So that's it, that's my pitch. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce the 12th Chancellor and President of Syracuse University, Ken Siverud. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, I'm so proud that you are serving as the inaugural Kramer Director of Syracuse University's Institute for Democracy, Journalism, and Citizenship. And I, I think that project, as you've just heard, is truly a patriotic project for the sake of our country, and I ask you all to support it. I also thank all of you who didn't go to Springsteen as well, and tell you that on September 7th, you can hear him in the dome, the JMA Wireless Dome in Syracuse. <laughs> and if you can't get tickets, let me know. <laughs> so, uh, Margaret's uh, incredible career has, is just such great preparation for what she's taken on. Uh, she's been so dedicated to journalistic integrity and democratic ideals, free speech, free press, citizenship. And I'm just so grateful to the leadership of both the Newhouse School and the Maxwell School for coming together and making this happen together in Washington. Um, and I'm grateful, of course, to SU trustee Larry Kramer and Maxwell School alumna Kathy Daykoff for their founding gifts in support of this institute. Um, I also have to say thank you to my friend Peter Gosselin. Uh, and I also have to embarrass him because uh, with th this has been a labor of love. I know a labor of love for Robin, but boy, it has sure been labor. Uh, to keep this going and to remind all of us the purpose of these awards and all the details that he's worked on so hard. And so can we please clap again for Peter. I know a lot of you here tonight are following the, the trail blazed by pioneering journalists like Robin Toner. And I know that the Toner Prize is now going to fall under the purview of our new institute in Washington, D.C., which is so appropriate given its mission uh, and given the values that motivated Robin Toner. Uh, and I know so many of you, like me, terrifically respect tonight's keynote speaker. I respect him most for his values and for his willingness to stand up for those values in good times and in bad times. United States Senator Mitt Romney is bipartisan and pragmatic, an unusual combination maybe these days, but a so valuable one. He's been an outspoken leader on national defense, on public lands, on China. His leadership was also critical to the passing of the landmark Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Bipartisan Emergency COVID Relief Act. Senator Romney, also had the courage to vote twice to impeach a sitting president from his own party, an action that earned him <laughs> it 
earned him the JFK Library's 2021 Profile in Courage Award for consistent and courageous defense of democracy. Of course, Senator Romney spent many years in public service after a wildly successful career as well in the private sector. He, he was the wildly successful governor of Massachusetts, twice ran for president of the United States, was his party's nominee in 2012. He is also the person who saved the 2002 Olympics for the United States in Salt Lake City. It's my honor to thank and to welcome U.S. Senator Mitt Romney. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, I, I'm thinking also about uh, Peter Goslin and, and your dear wife, Robin Toner. The older I get, the more I think about legacy. And it is a very powerful thing to have a legacy uh, like, uh, like both Peter and, and Robin have. Um, I don't imagine that I have to tell you that uh, if, as the Post claims, democracy dies in darkness, that we're in trouble. Um, and that's because it's getting pretty dark out there. I'm, I'm sure you can rehearse better than I can the declines in readership in journals and papers and the decline of the people who uh, are watching the news in the evening or in the morning. By the way, we, we conservatives used to dream about the collapse of the Post and the Times and the Globe. I bet. And uh, now it's like that old joke about the 60-year-old couple. They were walking on the beach. They stumble across a lamp in the sand. The genie pops out and says, I'll give you each one wish. The wife asks to have jewels. She's cut, immediately covered in diamonds and sapphires. The husband says, I'd like to see what it's like to be married to someone 20 years younger than me, at which point he turns 80. <laughs> now that's the kind of rude awakening and agonizing reappraisal that Republican politicians are experiencing these days. You see, when people increasingly get their news from sources where there are no auditors, no editors rather, and no fact checkers, where the uh, politician can simply lie about their opponent with impunity, that's a real problem. One of my Senate colleagues said to me the other day, he said, you know, we, in our campaigns, we used to dig into people's record to see their bad votes, and then we'd campaign attacking them on those bad votes. Now we don't have to do that anymore. You just lie about votes that they didn't even take. It's an extraordinary thing. Even worse for us is the fact that the public largely tunes out of political campaigns altogether. Social media algorithms, of course, feed people stories about things they like to read about. And they're not one out of 100 people who like to read about politics and campaigns every day. And as a result, very few people are able to follow a campaign. It, uh, it used to be that what we called earned media was the heart of a political campaign. There's nothing that has been found so far that replaces that. D just a case in point, I have a a friend, Lan He Chen, who worked on my campaign, he just recently ran for controller in the state of California. Every single newspaper in the state endorsed Lan He Chen. Nonpartisan, highly capable person. His opponent had gone bankrupt. This is a person who's running for controller. And yet, of course, Lan He got overwhelmed in, in the election, lost in a landslide in part because he's a Republican, and there was very little, very little coverage of the race that people actually followed. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here in this regard, but I think the relevant question is, so what do we do about it? My career in the private sector, and to some degree, both at the Olympics and in the state of Massachusetts, was helping develop strategies for enterprises that were in trouble, that needed a turnaround. And I'm not knowledgeable enough or, or uh, arrogant enough to try and suggest to you how you approach uh, the, the developments that are occurring in our world today. I just think it's critically important. So I'm going to offer you, if you will, the kind of game plan we followed, the approach we followed when we were in a turnaround situation, what we tried to do. And it's applicable whether it's a turnaround or actually an existing business. The first thing we did was we'd step into a, a business and do what we called a strategic audit. That was not a financial audit. 
it included finance, but everything, their competitors, their customers, their suppliers, their cost position, trends in the industry, every piece of data we could get. We used to call it wallowing in the data. We'd look at all the information we could, look for trends and developments, what was going up, what was going down. What we found was that oftentimes an enterprise tends to measure itself by the same standards over a long period of time. And the conformity to those standards and those measurements often kept them from learning about new opportunities or new risks or new challenges. And so we, we sort of put aside the old and look for something much broader with a lot of data. I, I'll tell you a story from my business career, if you'll allow me. Uh, a number of you uh, have uh, spent some time in New York. You know the Dwayne Reed drugstore chain. Uh, Dwayne Reed's owner told us, this was back in my investment days, that he had 50 drugstores on the island of Manhattan, and that that was all the island could handle, 50. Because he'd calculated how many steps you could got, walk between stores and everybody could get to any one of his stores easily. But we decided to get the data, get all sorts of information about their stores, the cannibalism that existed within the stores, their competitors. We, didn't, we couldn't get information about each of the competitors' stores except we put people outside the competitors' stores and counted the number of shopping bags people were carrying out, which gave us an estimate of how much volume they were doing. After all this data that we bathed ourselves in, we, we came to the conclusion that you could have a lot more stores than 50 stores in, in Manhattan. And so we bought Duane Reed as an investment. Today there are 200 Duane Reed stores in Manhattan some cannibalization, but the revenues and the profits went up dramatically. So digging into the data and looking for trends and opportunities that might not have been seen there before. Now, I know that most of you are already doing that. You're looking at mounds of data. Who's winning in the current media environment? Are there any cracks in the successes? Are some people failing and why are they failing? What are the demographic groups saying about what they want to watch, what they want to read, what they want to see? What are they saying? What are they actually doing? How is technology changing consumer behavior and how has it changed it in other countries where it's perhaps been adopted before us? Uh, we're obviously going to think about the impact of AI. Um, Mark Andreessen, famous venture capitalist in California, said that uh, software would eat everything. I think today he'd say that AI will completely transform, if not eliminate, everything. I can't help myself, just as a personal aside, to think that as AI continues to proliferate, that people will increasingly gravitate towards personal connections, towards relationships with other human beings, and between themselves and reporters or broadcasters that they have confidence in. So first for us was the strategic audit and digging into the data. Secondly, we would develop a game plan, a strategy. And our strategies always followed three critical rules, focus, focus, and focus. What we found in our business and consulting experience was that the number one reason for the failure of a business, either a startup or an existing company, was trying to do too many things at once. Of course, it's fine to put out some trial balloons, but you can't keep on investing in them and pouring resources into them year after year after year. You experiment, but you focus. Now, the final step of our turnaround effort was to match the people in the organization with the strategy that we devised. Because oftentimes, the strategy changed as we developed a new approach, and in some cases, that meant we needed to line up new folks to be able to carry it out. Now, the resurgence of journalism, and, and with it a more knowledgeable and informed electorate, wouldn't be so critical if this weren't such a critical time. I, I don't recall a period during my life when there were so many black swans flying around. China is on track to pass us economically, geopolitically, even militarily, and yet we kind of hide from that fact and, and lull ourselves into complacency. The, the, the actual figures are a little frightening. We sometimes say, oh, but China, they don't begin to spend as much as we do on our military. We spend more than Russia and China and all the other countries combined. Why, we're the strongest in the world. Well, you know what? Do you know how much of our military spending we spend on uh, procurement? 
15 percent. The great majority of our spending is on salaries and housing and health care and veterans benefits. China is growing their navy. It's going to be substantially larger than ours. So it's a much greater challenge than I think the immediacy uh, has, uh, has sunk into us. Um, I'll mention the debt as well. We Republicans have been talking about that forever, but this year our interest payment is going to be $650 billion. Our total military budget is $750 billion. When you're spending almost as much on interest as you spend on national defense, you got a problem. Neither party is willing to discuss an approach to solving this problem because, by the way, as you know, it all stems from the fact that our entitlements, which are two-thirds of spending, are growing faster than our economy. But neither political party wants to even talk about doing anything about entitlements. Climate change. My party's ostensible leader calls it a hoax. And I'm afraid the Democratic Party, on the other hand, has proposed, if you will, virtue signaling baby steps that would have the uh, uh, combined effect of being expensive and ineffective. And now, of course, the fourth black swan, AI. I saw a report that said of the people who are developing AI, on average, they believe there's a 10 percent chance the AI being developed will eliminate humanity. Now, you would think with something at that scale as a threat that Washington would be working to find ways to work with others around the world to make sure that something of that nature doesn't occur. So if democracy dies in darkness, we're counting on you and those that are being honored tonight who've shown us the way to help shed the light of truth on our public electorate. It's a task for which I thank you and I'm happy to join you this evening. Thank you. Senator Romney, on behalf of the Toner Prizes and everyone here, we want to thank you for being here tonight. I know that in this moment, uh, demonizing the media pays a lot of dividends these days in your line of work, and so we do appreciate you being here and in your confidence in the work that we do. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit here, and I, I'm like deeply reluctant to do this, but I graduated from college two years after uh, Robin passed away. And when I graduated, I remember thinking, I don't know if journalism is going to be OK. <laughs> I wanted to be a political journalist. It was the, my dream job. But I wasn't sure that it would still be there for me because of the trends that were happening in the industry at the time. Now I'm happy to say that um, I know more uh, Syracuse graduates in journalism than Harvard graduates, for the record. <laughs> and they've, many of them have been my colleagues over the years. And uh, it's a true testament to uh, the, the, the Newhouse School and what they've done to train up journalists in our profession. But, we also know, obviously, if you're in this room, you know this is a perilous time for all of us. It's a perilous time for journalism, for democracy. Um, we are facing a crisis of confidence. We are facing attacks on our business, on what we do. Uh, we're, we're facing attacks on the very idea of facts. And that is really uh, fundamentally what the Toner Prizes are here to celebrate. Fact-based political journalism that is revelatory, uh, that gives the audience something that they would not know otherwise. And I don't know, something tells me that I don't think an AI bot can do that, right? So uh, with that, I want to introduce the man who we wouldn't be here without. That's uh, Peter Gosselin, who has given his everything to this program. And many of you know him and the work that he's done on behalf of his beloved wife, Robin. So please give him a great warm welcome to the stage. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Romney. Um, I had a friend at the 
global political reporter at the Globe who said, was asked what his aim was with his uh, political reporting, and he said, shoot out windows on both sides of the street. Uh, I, uh, it, it's been hard. I have to say I'm more on the Democratic side than the Republican, and I'm pleased that you are here, and I'm pleased that some of uh, your alumni network were here, and I look to them to help us keep this balanced. Um, before, I, before I start on, uh, on the winners, I want to I want to say that um, I would be lucky if I lived up to half of the billing I got tonight. Um, I want to talk about a, another piece of luck. Uh, my meeting emerita Newhouse School faculty member Charlotte Grimes as we were starting this program. Charlotte took the program and made it her own. You've heard a number of people here tonight talk about the purpose of the prize is to be to recognize coverage that illuminates the electoral process, reveals the politics of policy, engages the public in democracy. Well, that's Charlotte's poetry, her love poem to American politics. And when journalists and contest coordinators read the Toner Prize uh, rules, they see that the prizes are for reporting not for columns, not for books, not for anything but political reporting. And that's a reflection of Charlotte's unshakable belief that reporting, that reporters, not editors, not news executives, not, I'm afraid, many of the rest of you, are at the center of the universe, reporters are. Charlotte retired from Syracuse in the Newhouse School in 2014. She did not retire from the Toner Program. For almost a decade now, she ran, she assembled the scores of judges and jurors that read the entries. She kept the panels of judges and jurors balanced seven ways to Sundays. And every year she could barely contain her uh, excitement about the winners. Until this year, when her health finally slowed her down enough, she had to pass the contest to a new generation. Charlotte, not unlike me, is old-fashioned. Among other things, she doesn't tweet. Oh, but she reads tweets. So I ask all of you out there who are tweeting anything about this uh, event to send her a shout out and tell her we wouldn't be here, not because of me, but because unless it was, it was her who made this possible. Thanks. Uh, American, American politics is a tough business. Trust in power has never been one of its hallmarks. There, are, there, are, but there have always been guardrails: sunlight, protests, rules and regulations. Sometimes formal, sometimes informal, even unspoken agreements about where the outer boundaries of the acceptable lie. In one way or another, all of this year's Toner Prize-winning work wrestles with the deeply divided state of our politics, asking whether the guardrails still work or even whether they're still there anymore. This year's uh, Toner Honorable Mention goes to a team of two news organizations that spotted a little noticed trend during uh, the COVID pandemic and put it to incredible uh, reporting use. The trend was that along with the rest of us, American church leaders were going virtual to stay connected to their parishioners. And as part of this, they were putting their sermons online. That meant reporters could look at what religious leaders were saying from their pulpits and find out whether what they were saying complied with a law that bars churches and other organizations as a condition of their tax-exempt status from getting involved in political campaigns. What they found were sermons like this one from a te Texas pastor. I got a candidate that God wants to win. I got a mayor that God wants to unseat. What they found were right-wing organizations, political organizations such as the Family Research Council registering as churches and their executive director, Tony Perkins, as a religious leader. Uh, and what they also found was that the IRS has revoked the tax-exempt status of just one church since the law was passed in 1954. For their excellent coverage, the Toner Honorable Mention for Excellence in 
Political reporting goes to ProPublica and tech, the Texas Tribune to reporters Jeremy Schwartz, Jessica Priest, Chris Moran, Perla Treviso, and Andrea Suoso. I hope I got it right. Uh, accepting is uh, Jeremy Schwartz. <laughs> you got to go right there. Let me do, get this out of your way. I don't want that to fall. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter, for that really nice intro. Um, as Peter said, this was really a, a, a big team effort, uh, both at ProPublica uh, and at the uh, Texas Tribune, which has, in the last couple of years, formed a really unique uh, investigative partnership that that I'm I'm really proud to be be part of. Um, but first, I, I want to give thanks to the Newhouse School of Public Communications and Syracuse University for this award, and special thanks to the family of Robin Toner uh, for supporting these awards and keeping her legacy alive. Um, as I said, this was a, a huge team effort with journalists from ProPublica and the Texas Tribune working together, as Peter said, to investigate a dramatic rise in pulpit endorsements since the 2020 election and the IRS's lack of enforcement. This project grew out of our reporting on the rise of political extremism and election denialism in rural Texas, where we found some churches and pastors regularly casting political opponents as evil and demonic. The IRS is charged with ensuring tax breaks don't go to churches that endorse candidates from the pulpit. But based on our reporting, enforcement has declined just as church political activity is ramping up in a major way. Churches and synagogues used to be one of the few places in American life where folks of different political persuasions mingled. Since 2020, and even predating that, uh, that, that's much less the case. As one expert told us, unchecked church political activity will further divide us as a nation, increase political partisanship, and ultimately threaten the foundation of a healthy democracy. The impact of our stories has been swift following Andrea Suoso's investigation into a right-wing think tank that achieved tax benefits after claiming to be a church, members of Congress demanded an investigation. One of the best things about journalism is being part of a team, pulling together in the trenches on a tight deadline, and this project brought two newsrooms together in wonderful ways. We are gratified at the investment, both in time and resources, that ProPublica and the Texas Tribune have put into investigating the forces shaping our democracy and politics since 2020. We are also gratified at the response to our project from readers across the country. Since the stories ran, we have heard from more than 200 readers about church political activity in their communities, showing that this is an aspect of modern political life that needs and deserves more attention. So thank you again from all of us for recognizing this work. Thank you. Our uh, next winner is from Nashville. Uh, and uh, before I uh, ta tell you about his work, I want to take a minute to recognize today's tragedy and to offer our, uh, our condolences to his city and to the families who lost members, especially young children who were simply going to school. Uh, the, uh, the Toner Prize for Local Reporting goes to a Nashville investigative reporter who started with a simple premise. If we think our uh, governing and lawmaking system is not doing the job, uh, we need, we first, the first thing we need to figure out is what job it is doing. 
the reporter bore down on the question of how the Tennessee General Assembly, a legislative body ruled by a Republican supermajority with near absolute power, makes laws. He showed how majority lawmakers depend on campaign contributions from well-financed special interests to stay in power and then do the bidding of those interests even when it doesn't benefit Tennesseans. He followed particular bills, for example, one pushed by Airbnb over the objections of neighborhood groups and political pushes, for example, for charter schools run by Hills, the conservative Hillsdale College, whose president said of Tennessee's teachers that Tennessee's teachers are, quote, trained in the dumbest part of the dumbest colleges in the country. Of the series that resulted, one toner judge said, quote, it's so hard to crack into the secretive world of campaign cash and lobbying in state capitals, but that the reporter had managed to do so and crisply showed viewers exactly how legislation is shaped and the exact questionable practices. For his spectacular coverage, and in a first for the Toner Prizes, the Toner Prize for Excellence in Local Political Reporting goes to a TV reporter, Phil Williams, with CBS's Nashville affiliate, WTVF-TV News Channel 5, for his revealed series. Phil. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for acknowledging that this has been a tragic day in my hometown. Today, Nashville became just the latest American city to experience a school shooting. Today, we lost three nine-year-old children and three adults. Uh, as, as a parent, as a Nashvilleian, as an American, let me just state the obvious. It doesn't have to be this way. A few years back on another investigation, the chief lobbyist for the gun industry in Tennessee explained the state's loose gun laws by saying, quote, Tennesseans love their guns. As I pointed out in that story, Tennesseans should also love their children. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, thank you to the judges, thank you to the Toner family for, for this recognition. I want to especially acknowledge the work of the talented photojournalists who took this vision and brought it to life, uh, Brian Staples, Mike Rose, Bob Stinnett, producer Kevin Wisniewski. I also want to thank my friend and colleague, Assistant News Director Michelle Bonnet, who not only encouraged this project, but thought for it when I routinely turned in scripts for stories that were much longer than you would normally see for local television. Uh, also thanks to my ever supportive news director Sandy Boonstra, general manager Lynn Plantinga, and our owners at EW Scripts, where the motto is fittingly, give light and the people will find their way. And finally, my wife Cheryl, who lovingly supports my obsession with trying to save the world one story at a time. And, and, and my now adult son Jackson for his encouragement. So far this project has resulted in more than 50 individual stories, a one hour documentary, and I can assure you there is more to come. It has truly been a, a passion project. As a result, I come before you this evening to accept feeling not a small amount of exhaustion, but also hopeful that this recognition will send a strong signal about the type of political reporting that is desperately needed at the state house level if this, experience, if this experiment with democracy is to succeed. 
This project began from a period of agonizing during my normal holiday break in December of 2021 as I struggled to find a project for the upcoming year that would speak to the times in, in which we now live. It occurred to me that even though Americans are deeply divided politically, we're pretty united in the sense that the system is broken and that you cannot talk about how the system can be fixed until you see how it really works. As Robin Toner herself wrote of her colleague David Rosenbaum, great political reporting is often about, quote, real people getting something or getting something taken away, and that there is on most stories something approximating truth out there if you are smart enough and hungry enough to find it. That description describes our approach to this story. We wanted to show viewers how Tennessee's Capitol Hill really works using issues that affect real people to show how special interests and their allies will sometimes lie to achieve their goals. The good news is the response to this project has been tremendous. It affirmed my sense that viewers and readers are desperate for journalism that makes sense out of the chaos. And that is especially critical at the state house level where there are fewer journalists than ever following the money and exposing the shenanigans. For me, the lesson has been that there is an urgent need for news organizations to treat political reporting at the state house level as an, an investigative beat, to report not only what is happening, but to explain why to show who is financing these legislative battles and to understand the ultimate agendas. If we do that, if we shine a light on how our broken system affects real people, it is my hope that the people will indeed find their way. Thank you so much for this affirmation of our station's commitment to this journalism. So the final prize. Uh, the Toner Prize for Excellence in National Political Reporting goes to a group of reporters for something that's vastly more rare than the popular notion of journalism pictures it. A flat out, no question about it, scoop of national and social consequence and they did something equally impressive once they got the scoop. They handled it by sticking closely to the facts and writing cautiously. These reporters exclusively broke the news that the United States Supreme Court had voted to strike down Roe v. Wade and a half century of constitutional protections for abortion. They published the complete initial draft majority opinion written by Justice Samuel Alito the first time in the court's modern history that a draft opinion had been publicly disclosed while a case was still pending. And then they went on to scrutinize the tactics of the conservative legal movement used in building a new Supreme Court majority during the Trump years, including how conservative activist Leonard Leo helped facilitate the sale of Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway's polling business just as Conway was promoting Leo's judicial uh, candidates to uh, Trump how the religious right sought to influence the court by recruiting couples to wine and dine the justices, and how lax uh, ethical standards allowed justices' spouses to profit from clients with business before the court. And when the scoop transformed the politics of the midterm in last year, putting abortion rights at the center of the debate, they covered that as well. For example, with stories about how Democratic candidates swiftly changed their campaign focus and how the shift produced a better than expected Democratic performance in the midterms. In some sense, and again, this is a real rarity in journalism, these reporters' stories became the object of their own coverage. <laughs> um, and for this extraordinary work, the Toner Prize for Excellence in National Political Reporting goes to Politico reporters Josh Gerstein, Alex Ward, Peter Canellis. Haley Fuchs, Heidi Prisbera, Elena Sider, and Holly Otterbaum. <laughs>
over here. Okay, you don't okay. need to be behind the podium. Okay. Here. Here, here you go. It's heavy as that. Now you got to shake it. <laughs> Can you fit them? <laughs> Let me get this out of your way. Oh, that's yours. I'll take that. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Peter. Um, thank you to all of you in the audience. Uh, a bunch of thank yous here at the top. Uh, thanks to Chancellor Sivera, Dean Lodato, the rest of the folks from Syracuse, Provost Ritter, uh, Dean Van Slyke. Um, I'd also like to say Thank you to Margaret Talev, uh, who's been a friend and colleague of mine for, I think, uh, more than a decade now. Congratulations to her on her new position with Syracuse. It seems like just yesterday, Margaret, we were covering the White House together, uh, staking out meetings at the EEOB, and, um, but it wasn't yesterday, it was 14 years ago. Um, also, thanks to Abby Phillip, who did not go to Syracuse, but, but to another fine university up to the north of here. And um, I think there are at least four of us from Massachusetts um, on the stage at the moment. And um, Senator Romney, we uh, appreciated your rather dark uh, speech. The, pro the, the program, though, says that you're from Utah, but you look very, very familiar to those of us from Massachusetts. Uh, anyway, on a more serious note, I want to thank you for being willing to stand up for the essential role of the press and independent reporting as part of what makes our country great. And then I think on behalf of all of us, I'd like to congratulate the other uh, winners tonight, ProPublica and the Texas Tribune, for their impressive work, and Phil Williams we just heard from, from WTVF. Um, in addition to the folks we have up on the stage who were just introduced, there are a number of other uh, politicos here tonight. Matt Kaminsky, our uh, editor-in-chief, and then a number of other uh, politicos who worked on these stories along with us, uh, Anita Kumar, Sadiq Reddy, Louisa Savage, Marty Katie, and Annie Bryan. Also, uh, Daphna Linzer, who was involved in putting this whole package of coverage together. And I'd like to thank my wife, June Shi, who's here. Um, and on behalf of Alex, I'd like to thank his, his wife, Christine Fair, for putting up with our somewhat furtive behavior for a period of time uh, last year. Um, what I wanted to speak to, thank you, by all means. Um, what I wanted to speak to tonight is uh, this question, and here I'm going to paraphrase the late Admiral Stockdale, and I'm probably dating myself by doing that, which is, uh, what are we doing here? Um, why are we here accepting a political reporting award for reporting on the Supreme Court? Some of the reporting we did, particularly Elena and Holly, surrounded the electoral impact, as you just heard um, from Peter Gosselin but a lot of it was focused on the machinations of the court. Um, it's probably for the judges to, to answer that question, but I'll be a little presumptuous here and try to answer it myself. I think the reason we're here is a recognition of how central the courts have become to our current political debate. When I came to Washington about three decades ago, the default presumption was that most big issues were resolved in Congress. Um, over the past couple of decades, it now seems so many of the major policy decisions on abortion, health insurance, climate change, guns, and so forth are resolved in the courts and often, ultimately, at the Supreme Court. In fact, it often seems like litigation has replaced legislation as the preferred means of advancing one's agenda in this country. Whether that's healthy or unhealthy in a democracy is a valid topic for debate, but what is clear is that we in the media need to up our game covering the third branch of government. We have begun to do that at Politico, hiring a new legal editor and reporter just in the last few weeks. And what we're trying to do is take the sort of holistic 360 degree approach we take to covering Congress and the White House and apply it to the operation of the Supreme Court and the lower courts. No one thinks simply reading the congressional record or looking over the text of newly introduced bills or attending hearings would be a robust, sensible way to cover the Congress or that simply attending presidential speeches and bill signings would be a good way to cover the executive branch. Yet, for decades, much of the coverage of the Supreme Court has taken this very literal approach. Instead, we're trying to explore efforts to influence the justices and the courts outside the courtroom, exploring how the justices' personal interactions influence their decisions, how their spouses and their families and their finances and even their health impact the court, how outside groups and advocates often seek to alter the atmosphere around the court in ways that go beyond the formal arguments and briefs. In short, we're trying to take 
as I say, a more holistic and perhaps a more realistic view of the courts that treats them as part of the political process in Washington and not somehow above it. People are taking notice. Obviously, this approach resonates with readers. I can tell you tonight that Politico recently recorded its 10 millionth unique view of our initial scoop on the Dobbs decision, underscoring that story's standing as our most read story ever at Politico. The response to our broader coverage of the federal courts has also been strong. Imitation is also the sincerest form of flattery, so I can pass along that in the wake of our Dobbs story and the flurry of additional reporting we've done in the months since, since that Peter Gosselin outlined, at least two other major competitors of ours have decided to commit additional resources to covering the Supreme Court, rethinking and broadening their approach to that powerful institution. And to that we say, the more the merrier. Let's give the third branch of government at all levels the attention it deserves. Thanks again to everybody. Keep up the good work. What Josh failed to mention is that we used to be podmates, Josh. Back in, the, back in the day, I learned a lot from listening to Josh uh, talk to people on the phone and dive deep, deep, deep into uh, legal filings. And so congratulations to Politico, to Josh, and to all of the award winners tonight. It's incredibly inspiring. Um, as we wrap up, I want to offer a few more thanks. Larry Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> One more for you, but also to Precision Strategies and its co-founder, Stephanie Cutter, who've understood the importance of these prizes and supported them. The Knight Foundation has also underwritten the program almost from its inception. And also a very special thank you to Robin's extended family, many of whom are here in this room tonight. Bridget and Patrick McCall, sisters Jane, Pat, Gretchen, sisters and brother-in-law, including Eugenia Adolfo, Terry McConnell, and John, and Dee Farrell. You all have uh, contributed to this in more ways than one, including financially, so thank you again. And thank you all to those of you who come year in and year out, many of you colleagues and friends of Robbins, uh, those of you who attend uh, in order to honor these incredible reporters and the institutions that employ and support them. And finally, I got to meet a lot of incredible students tonight, Syracuse University students. Please give yourselves a round of applause. So I started by saying that I, when I started as a journalist, I was worried that journalism wouldn't exist. But now here we are, it's 2023. And I have to say, I'm really maybe more optimistic about journalism than I have ever been. Um, I, I hope that maybe we take uh, the lesson from Senator Romney and like there is a Dwayne Reed on almost every corner in, um, in New York City, there will be, you know, journalism startups everywhere in America uh, in the years to come. I love seeing outlets like Axios and Semaphore and Punchbowl. And back in the day when I started my journalism career at Politico, it was also a startup. And look at where we are tonight. So... To all the students in the audience, I hope you take that as a bit of inspiration. There is so much out there and a critical piece of, you know, something to take away from tonight's ceremony. Think about what you do, not where you do it. Look at where the awards went tonight. There is incredible fact-based probing journalism to be done all over the country and in all kinds of outlets, big and small. So go do the work, make your mark. Thank you to all of you who are here tonight. I hope you all get home safely. I hope you enjoyed this great evening together. And thank you and have a great evening. <laughs>